Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh One, and today we're going to be talking about demons. More specifically, the notable named demons of the Immaterium. If you guys are new to the channel, we post Warhammer 40k lore videos every single day, so subscribe to the channel if you guys want to get more. And if you have any suggestions for either demons or any other topic of Warhammer 40k that you guys would like us to cover, let me know in the comment section below and I'll try to create a video for you guys. And if you enjoy our content, don't forget to hit the like button. But with that said, let's get into 40 facts on the Demons of Chaos. The realm known as the Immaterium is the home of the Chaos Gods, a twisted and unfathomable dimension deadly to any mortal being that enters without the blessings of one of the gods. But the warp is not occupied by only the greater gods of chaos. In this realm, the gods have created their own personal servants, known as demons. Separate from the flow of the Immaterium, demons are beings of completely different nature to their masters. They wage wars, defend their realm's boundaries, enforce the divine will of their creators, and can leave the Immaterium. Slaves of immense power, the demons are in many ways a small imprint of their master's essence. None of them are created equal. Some must fight to get the attention of their creator, while others are destined to become legendary. The following are an assortment of demons encountered by the Imperium of Man, and luckily categorized by the Demonologist of the Inquisition. Terrifying and dangerous, these demons have gone above and beyond their destructive capabilities of the standard Demons of Chaos. Many acquire their own unique names and history within the records of the Imperium of Man. Found within the legends and stories told by the followers of the God of Change, Zinch was once the supreme ruler of the Immaterium. His powers were vastly superior to those of any of his brothers, and in their envy and arrogance, the other dark gods set aside their differences and joined forces to overthrow the architect of fate. Territories that were too vast and maddening to comprehend were devastated in the catastrophic conflict that followed. During the final battle, with defeat seemingly inevitable, Zinch cast a great conjuration upon himself, crystallizing his thoughts and body, even as he was lifted from his perch and hurled against the endless mountains. Upon impact, his mighty form was shattered into 10,000 pieces. Each of these shards contained a tiny fragment of the great sorcerer's essence, a single spell or a word of change, and they were flung as they were across every corner of space and time. The legends of many intelligent races suggest that this momentous event marked the beginning of the use of psychic powers in real space. After his great defeat, Zinch created the two blue scribes, also known as the Wandering Wizardkin, or Zinch's Questors. They are a pair of blue horrors named Pitrex and Ziratp. These demons were tasked with retrieving every single shard scattered across the galaxy. They traveled through the many dimensions of creation to find and record every one of these lost spells. To aid his minions, Zinch gave the scribes one of his flying discs, both for speed and to carry the huge amount of parchment and ink that the two require for their task. Not by chance has Zinch chosen these lowly blue horrors for such an important task. The great schemer, as always, was wary of what a rival demon could do if he ever gained such a terrible power as would be granted if all the missing elements of his essence were to be recovered. With their limited intelligence and being eternally in conflict with one another, Wandering demons will never constitute a problem for law. Zinch did bestow some powers to the scribes, but made sure to add some safeguards against betrayal. For example, Pteryx can transcribe syllables and magic spells into profane chaos runes and glyphs, but can't read his own writing. And Zerap is able to cast spells by reading Pteryx's writing, but cannot predict which spell he's going to cast. Thus, the blue scribes create havoc in combat, as they unleash a barrage of random psychic effects on any who threaten them. Since their creation, the Blue Scribes have appeared across the warp throughout time and in the most remote corners of the galaxy as they search for lost grimoires or skilled practitioners of sorcery to interrogate. Their quest often leads the Blue Scribes to battlefields in real space, where the two invariably end up aiding the side which has Zincha's favor, whether the recipient knows it or not. In battle, Pteryx siphons the power of enemy psychers to learn and catalog their secrets, while Zerap unleashes a sorcerous barrage by reading from the huge collection of scrolls they have collected throughout the millennia. They always argue with each other about which spell to use next, and if a foe happens to get close enough to strike him in melee, the blue horrors will begin to blame each other for allowing such a terrible situation to occur, all the while keeping their attackers at bay with their petulant stabs of their quills. On the rare occasion they best a foe in close combat, inevitable arguments begin about which of the pair was more heroic. And should the blue scribes improvise weapons ever prove ineffective, as they usually do, 
they will hastily make their escape upon their disc of Zinch, careening off in search of easier winds. It is fortune for the mortal races of the galaxy that the pair are almost constantly interrupted in their quest by the conflicts of Zinch's enemies and by others, for if they ever complete their mission, Zinch will regain his supremacy and once more rule over all of creation. The task of cataloging the potency of the Plague Lord's many and splendid diseases falls to Epidemius, the Lord of Decay's chosen tallymen, one of the seven proctors of pestilence who presides over the plague bearers. Born high on a rotten palanquin, Epidemius moves amongst the demons of Nurgle, making note of all the varied afflictions and poxes unleashed into the universe. It is a never-ending task, for Nurgle is constantly creative and his hordes are ever keen to spread new and wonderful diseases. Epidemius' nurglings act as assistants, secreting ink for his quill, growing parchment like strips of skins from their back for their master to tear free, and counting upon a great death head abacus that grows from the planks of the palanquin. The nurglings also serve as guards for the tallymen, and swarm around any foe that approaches too closely. Unlike the usual babble and giggling that accompanies most nurglings, Epidemius' brood are silent. They understand the importance of Epidemius' task, and suffer his ire when any ill-timed giggle or belch breaks his concentration. Only the slimy progress and the gnawing scratching of Epidemius' quill breaks this sacred quietude. In battle, Epidemius surveys the spread of filth and decay, taking note of every bubble, postulate, and spore. Even as he writes, Father Nurgle becomes aware of Epidemius' learning, distilling the information for future experiments and brews. If Epidemius were ever to make an error or an untimely observation, Nurgle's displeasure would be dire indeed. And for this reason, Epidemius focuses wholly on his task, even in the midst of desperate battle. Guiding his plagueness, Epidemius follows the filthy spores of his master's work through both the demon and mortal realms seeking out new strands of viruses, fresh species of bacteria, and innovative symptoms of contagion. To better observe the spread of disease, Epidemius orders his palanquin carried to the front lines, where the nurgling bearers and the obscene heralds angrily strike out at any foe that gets too close to disturb the tallyman's work. After his bloody awakening, Uzzel wandered the realms of the warp and reality in search of the mightiest foes against which to test his martial skills. And mortal or not, all warriors fell to his blade. When the bloodletter took his 888 skull, the demonic champion in the making was chosen by his god to enter the skull pit, the proving ground for all coronet bloodletter champions. There, Uzzel was not only unmatched, but he beheaded every one of his opponents without receiving so much as a scratch in return. In recognition of Uzel's achievement, Kor not only anointed him as both a herald and his sacred executioner, but bestowed the singular title of Skulltaker. With this rank came warp energies that swelled his body, and as an extension of his form, his Hellblade also grew in power. Thus was formed the Slayer Sword a formidable weapon capable of cutting through reinforced plasteel and destroying even the most monstrous of beasts with a single blow. In the midst of every battle, Skulltaker seeks out the mightiest foe on the battlefield so that he may slay them himself with his serrated hellblade. A duelist beyond compare, Skulltaker weaves his blade in bloody crescents that dismember but rarely slay. Those who flee his confrontation are cut down without remorse, while those who stand their ground usually suffer the same fate, though at a slower and far more painful pace. Skulltaker likes to take his time with his foes, dismembering them limb from limb, yet not taking their life until the end to prolong its pleasure in the slaughter. Only when its opponent is a limbless horror upon the ground does it offer up death, grabbing their head, anointing the eight words of sacrifice while it uses warp flame to wreathe the victim's head in hellfire, burning away flesh and muscle until only a bare, charred skull remains. With a savage twist, he tears free the naked trophy, snapping it from the spine and holding it aloft for all to see. Skulltaker then places it within the grisly sack it carries, which contains all other skulls it has liberated from their owners during the battle. He butchers his way towards his next victim and proceeds to enact the same ritual, 
over and over again, until no foe worthy of his undivided attention remains. Since his ascension, the Champion of Corn has carved a bloody path through the millennia. Skulltaker fought alongside the demon Primarch Angron on the world of Armageddon, cutting down several Grey Knight Brother captains in his infinite wrath. On Agrippina VI, the Skulltaker slew the Orc Warlord Grimsnack Uruk in a titanic duel that lasted a solar day and a night, the combatants wading through the multitude of corpses that the Warlord's once unstoppable horde thought could stand against the demons. In another instance, a full score of Aldari Exarchs fell to his blade, even their skill and experience falling short of the Heralds. Indeed, every race in the galaxy has had a fearful legend concerning the Skulltaker and his horrific exploits. When he eventually returns to the Brass Citadel within the Realm of Chaos, Skulltaker presents his trophies to his master. Most of them, Korn takes for himself. They are impaled upon brass spikes that adorn his keep. A few of them, those belonging to warriors that offered their killer a real challenge before they fell, Korn begrudgingly allows the greatest of his sacred executioners to keep. Skulltaker weaves these into a horrific cloak of skulls he wears using bloody sinews taken from the bodies of other victims to sit alongside his other great triumphs. Skulltaker often goes to war at the head of the Cohort of Blood, an assemblage of the greatest bloodletters selected from amongst the Demonic Legion's ranks. The Herald's mere presence on the field of battle drives Korn's lesser demons to impossible heights of frenzy, as the bloodletters regard him as the pinnacle of their kind an exemplar of their bloodthirsty god's demands. Sometime during this reign of carnage, Skulltaker claimed a juggernaut demonic steed named Kul Tyran as his mount, which has helped him carve a bloody path through thousands of worlds. Kul Tyran was said to have been the toughest demonic mount in the juggernaut stockade. The demon beast has killed more of his kin than any other before or since. He prowled the perimeters of the pens, regularly making bids for freedom. He once shattered the compound's wall and would have escaped were it not for a dozen heralds of corn who held him back. Skulltaker selected Cold Tyran from the pack when the sacred executioner witnessed the beast goring three heralds at once. Since then, the pair have regularly erupted from the warp to harvest a bounty of skulls for the blood god. They have dueled others on countless worlds in the mortal realm, never yet losing a challenge. While Skulltaker decapitates his foes with the Slayer Sword, Cold Tyran tears into the armor as if it were soft flesh, and flesh as if it were ash. So pleased is Korn with the pair's bloody work, that while in the Immateria, Cold Tyran is the only juggernaut permitted to prowl the smoke-choked passageways of the Blood God's Brass Citadel, as its reward for engaging in unbridled destruction. The Mask of Slanesh, also known simply as The Mask, is the most infamous demonet and herald of Slanesh to have ever plagued the sentient creatures of the galaxy. Once the chief maiden of Slanesh, The Mask used to comb the Dark Prince's shining hair and oil it with fragrant balms. When Slanesh's mood was grim, The Mask would dance to lighten his thoughts, enrapturing her god with the most dazzling and acrobatic displays. Yet for all of Slanesh's indulgences, the mask was ultimately to become the most despised of all the Prince of Pleasure's servants. During the eternal wars within the realm of chaos, between the chaos gods, known as the Great Game, it came about that Zinch tricked Slanesh into an unwinnable battle against Korn and Nurgle, the ill-fated Provocation Wars. It was a hard-fought series of campaigns that ended only with the Dark Prince's utter defeat and subsequent humiliation by his arch-nemesis. Seeing the dark mood of her master, the Mask took it upon herself to ease his heart with her most energetic and scantilizing dance ever. Where once her leaps and pirouettes had brought laughter and joy, now Slanesh's bitter heart saw mockery. Each perfect combination of moves calculated to be barbed to his pierced pride. Slanesh's emotions came to a boiling point, and the Prince of Pleasure unleashed his frustration on his handmaiden, branding her as a traitor and placing a fell curse upon her, proclaiming that if she so wanted to dance, then she must dance forevermore without pause.
and so it came to be that the mask was forced to dance eternally across space and time for both mortal and immortal audiences. Such has been the mask's doom to dance across eternity. In the circles of Slaanesh's realm, she pirouettes for other demonettes, entrancing them with her movements until they are so enraptured they can no longer move or speak. She dances at the gate of corn, mocking the bloodletters who snarl and growl at her impotence. The mask dances across the mortal worlds of the galaxy, trapping those who witness her. Where mortals indulge their senses, where excess overcomes restraint, the mask appears to lead the incautious on a dance of doom. As she enacts the tales of Slaanesh's glorious history, his bespoken destiny, and his most unholy conquests, her golden mask flickers and changes, matching the roles of the character she plays in a manner eerily similar to the way of a harlequin performance. So powerful is the lure of the mask's display that all who see it feel compelled to join in the performance. Immortal demons and crude mortals alike feel his calling in his heart and are powerless to resist, joining the show as if they had rehearsed their parts for an eternity. In the dance of dreaming, where the characters of a slumbering prince awaits to be born, the mask's tropes is lulled into a lethargic trance, while in the dance of death, a reenactment of one of Slaanesh's greatest victories over corn, the cast leaps and flails and claws at their eyes and throats. Consumed by ecstasy and agony of the mask's aura, they will happily dance themselves to death, using up their last ounce of energy, their dying breath, to keep pace with her twirls and somersaults. The mask has been known to turn up unheralded on battlefields across the galaxy. She has danced to the screams of those massacred by Korn's bloodletters and pirouetted to the drowning counts of Nurgle's plague bearers, a figure of grace amongst the brutal and the bloated. More often, however, the mask will appear alongside the conclaves of her master's demonic legion of excess. Her insane prancing reaches new heights when she is at the center of a Courant legion, surrounded by converting demonettes. There, her dazzling acrobatics inspire her sisters to magnificent performances of bloodshed. If she could follow her own will, that is where she would stay. But Slaanesh can be petulant and still refuse to remove the hex upon her. So does the mask continue dancing wherever the fickle whims of her curse takes her. During the Battle of Baltan, the mask emerged on the craft world of Baltan alongside the bloodthirster Scarbrand and was able to invade Baltan through a webway portal on the demon world of Ursilia that had once been an exodited controlled maiden world before it was invaded by the joint demonic forces of Korn and Slaanesh. The mask was eventually able to invade Baltan's infinity circuit and would have consumed all of its souls for Slaanesh if it wasn't for the efforts of Ivrain of Inari who was able to summon the Incarn, the Avatar of Inead, the Eldari god of the dead who banished the demon back into the warp with his powers. The mask's behavior is eerily similar to that of the Elder Harlequin. This is not surprising as the Prince of Pleasure was born from the collective hedonistic depravity of the Eldar race, enticing Eldar, especially Harlequins, into dancing themselves to death is one of the mask's favorite activities. The Harlequins have a performance that tells the tale of how the mask was once able to infiltrate one of the troops and entrance both the troop and the audience with her whirling spells. It was only when a solitaire appeared that the spell was eventually broken. As the only Eldar able to impersonate she who thirsts, the solitaire was immune to the mask's spell and was able to match her move for move for six Terran days and nights until the mask finally faltered and missed a step. Horrified at her failure, the mask fled and she now seeks eternal revenge on the servants of the Laughing God. Corn is the Blood God, Lord of Rage, Taker of Skulls. He is Wrath Incarnate, the embodiment of a never-ending lust to dominate and destroy. The Lord of Skulls controls some of the most vicious demons of chaos, but one of the most loyal and obedient coronet demons is the Hound of Vengeance, the three-headed flesh hound of Korn, known as Karnak. For those that experience the wrath of Korn, mortal and demon alike, there is but one fate. Those who insult the raging god's pride 
Warriors that break Korn's creed. Cowards that refuse to shed blood. Korn's anger reaches them all. From one end of the galaxy to the other, across space and time, Karnak is the incarnation of Korn's vengeance. Relentless, vicious, and single-minded, Karnak hunts his prey across the warp demon realms, through the depths of space, across whirling gas clouds, and blazing supernovas. No army can defend against him, no wall can bar his path. When not hunting, Karnak prowls the shadows of the Blood God's throne room. Karnak is ever vigilant, for he has three heads, and while one feeds on the bones of Korn's sacrifices, the other two keep watch. None pass into Korn's throne chambers, except with the leave of this watchful guardian. Sometimes an unwary bloodletter strays too close, and Karnak pounces. It is a brutal end signaled by the snap of a vertebrae, a splattering of blood, and the chorus of chilling snarls. As Korn's anger rises, Karnak ceases his feeding and lopes to his master's side. With a roar, Korn unleashes Karnak. The great hound of Korn lifts his three heads, nostrils flaring as he catches the scent of his prey. He paces to and fro, growling and snarling as each head in turn savors the portion of the scent. Each head can trace Karnak's quarry in a different fashion. The first head follows the trails through space. The second tracks the scent through time. And the third head, the most dangerous, senses the quarry through his thoughts, scenting their innermost feelings through dreamscapes and delusions. The third head guarantees that no prey eludes Karnak. Those with wit and skill can avoid temporal detection, but no man can outrun his own mind. Once Karnak has fixed upon the odor of his victim, the Hound of Vengeance lopes forth on his hunt, gathering pace as the trail grows stronger. Karnak bounds from realm to realm, flashing across insubstantial landscapes of nightmares, leaping from star to star. His growls echo in the dreams and the waking thoughts of his target, and his prey is overwhelmed by the foreshadow of approaching doom. Karnak's howl resounds across space and time, drawing other flesh hounds to the chase. As the pursuit covers leagues and light years, a pack of slavering beasts form around Karnak, hungry for the kill. Their howls join the roar of their leader, as they approach their prey. In a frenzy of fang and blood, Karnak and his demon pack strike, tearing through anything in their path. Their quarry is quickly cornered, and Karnak strikes, tearing hunks of flesh, eviscerating and dismembering with his metallic claws. In the end, with the flopping shredded remains of their victim clasped tightly in all three jaws, Karnak hurtles back to Korn's throne room to present his gift to his master. There, a pleased blood god invariably adds the skulls to the ever-growing pile upon which his throne sits. As befits Karnak's favored status, he has been gifted with a superior version of the brass collar worn by other flesh hounds. Possessed of Korn's hatred for sorcery, this thick metal band withstands psychic powers as easily as his scaled skin repels rainwater. Karnak always remembers those psychers who dare cast their despised magic at him in battle. Though it may take years, the Hound will inevitably have his vengeance, and once his prey has been killed, he will take great satisfaction in chewing up its sorcerer's bones. Ancient and powerful beyond imagining, the demon prince known as Bellacor, sometimes referred to as the Dark Master or the First Damned, is the very first demon prince to have been empowered by all four chaos gods. The origins of Bellacor are spoken only of in legends and rumors, tales torn from the tongues of captive demons, or forbidden lore recorded on ancient crypt walls. Crude pictographs found in the caves of dry, dead worlds or primitive statues hidden in the sunken depths of death world oceans speak to Bellacor's immortal reign within the galaxy. Scholars have been driven mad looking for hints of the demon prince's presence woven into the history of the universe, always lurking in the shadows behind the rise and expansion of the mortal race. Even the secretive Grey Knight's chapter of Space Marines, created by the Emperor to combat the demonic forces of the war, know little of Bellacor's true history, only conflicting lies and impossible fabrications. Legends tell of Bellacor's ruling over mortal empires since the dawn of time. The demon prince conquering a world and subjugating its people, forcing them to worship him as a god. 
when the race would finally fall into decline, ruined by Bellicor's greed and malevolence, the demon prince would move on, finding a new burgeoning sentient species to be his plaything. Several times the demon prince is said to have been the lord of sector-spanning stellar empires, a dark demon god ruling over thousands of worlds and billions of loyal followers. Relics and ruins of dead worlds still exist that suggest that there might be some truth to these legends. Whether their source was Bellicor or not is more difficult to say. The Adeptus Mechanicus Tech Magos, Kyber, has spent his life piercing together the history of Bellicor in his exploration of the galactic wilderness, hunting down ancient relics of the Dark Age of Technology. Following the faint trails left by Bellicor's passage through history, Magos Kyber has found winged statues carved from the fossilized bones of psychers, crumbling scrolls of human skin that show thousands of tiny figures bowing down before a dark winged shape, and horn fragments sealed in sacred caskets. Unaware of Bellicor's true nature, Kyber has become convinced that these objects are linked to one alien overlord, an ancient creature that has existed for millions of Terran years, in various guises and behind countless vile deeds. Unknown to Kyber, he is being manipulated by Bellacor. The demon prince places the first clues to his existence in Kyber's path, leading the Magos to the ruins of worlds he once ruled. From this seed of curiosity, Kyber has discovered new star systems, planets, and ruined empires long forgotten by Bellacor. While the demon prince helps Kyber from the shadows, the Magos gathers up hidden and forgotten legacies Bellacor has left behind ultimately returning to the demon prince his lost objects of power, while also erasing his existence from history. Like a petulant first son, Bellicor has always had a bitter jealousy towards anything or anyone that wins the favor of the dark gods. For millennia, the demon prince undermines the plots and schemes of the demonic and mortal servants of chaos. However, what Bellicor mistook for free will and a measure of revenge against those that have usurped his power is merely the great game between the Chaos Gods. When the Demon Prince brought down a champion of Nurgle, invariably he was doing Zinsha's bidding, and while laying a warrior of the Blood God low, he was fulfilling the will of Slanash. Bellacor remains blinded by these manipulations of the Chaos Gods, his own thirst for power and pleasure of proving his mastery over rival champions of Chaos seems enough to make him forget the Sorcerer's Tethers the Dark Gods continually try to wind tightly around his neck. Bellicor wields a unique ether blade, known as the Blade of Shadows. Its ghostly form is eternally between shape and shadow, solidarity and silhouette. Mastery of this weapon enables Bellicor to scythe through armor, scale, flesh and bone without resistance, its essence changing in an instant from formless shadow to murderous edge at its master's whim. For centuries, Bellicor has been watching the War Master of Chaos, Abaddon the Despoiler, influencing events as they ebb and flow around Abaddon, knowing on some level that their fates are bound. During each of Abaddon's Black Crusades, the Master of Shadows has been lurking in the background. During the Third Black Crusade, legends say that it was Bellicor who manipulated the Demon Prince Talomain into aiding the Despoiler and ultimately assaulting Cadia. Bellicor was also reputed to be the one who told Abaddon of the treachery of Drakarth the Sightless, leading to the destruction of the renegade Chaos Space Marines, the Sons of Ai, during the Sixth Black Crusade. In both instances, Bellicor's actions seem to have aided Abaddon's rise to power, though closer examination exposes possible darker motives at work. Though Talaman extracted a terrible toll upon the armies of Cadia, he did so the cost of numerous Black Legion warbands, much to Abaddon's ire. While Descartes the Sightless could in time have proven to be a powerful ally for the Despoiler, had not Bellicor fanned the embers of vengeance burning in Abaddon's heart. Even during the 13th Black Crusade, the demon prince Bellicor and the Iron Warrior's warsmith, Shantu, united in their desire to see Abaddon's Black Crusade upstaged. They launched an attack on Terra itself, emerging from a warp rift that appeared at the center of an Imperial Fist chapter's flagship, the Phalanx. The unholy allies aimed to corrupt that mighty vessel to their purpose and use it to bombard the Emperor's Imperial Palace. The newly reformed Imperial Fist Third Company, under the command of the recently promoted Captain Garadon, 
fought with a determination that belied their inexperience, and the access ways and halls of the great starship were soon choked with the broken corpses of demons in what became known as the Battle of the Phalanx. Ultimately, Garadon delayed the demonic incursion long enough for the Phalanx to rouse its engines and enter the warp, thus ending the immediate threat to Terra. The mighty vessel hurled through the Immaterium, and neither side proved able to contact their allies in real space. Garadon and his company gathered for one last effort, and the Phalanx lower decks were consumed with raging fires as the spectral warriors of the Legion of the Damned suddenly joined the battle. Taking their arrival as a sign that victory might yet be theirs, the third company counterattacked and retook control of the Mobile Star Fortress. Afterwards, they brought the Phalanx through the warp to aid in the defense of Cadia, including mortally wounding the Blackstone Fortress, Will of Eternity. Despite all their efforts, the crucial fortress world still fell to the despoiler. However, the Phalanx escaped the fall and helped Cadia survivors flee the destruction of their world. In recent times, Bellacor has been sighted fighting alongside the demon legions of each of the Chaos Gods since the opening of the Great Rift. He has pledged aid to several renegade chapters, even fighting in the company of Abaddon the Despoiler and his Black Legion once more. Exactly what his winding plot seeks to achieve is like so much about the shadowy demon prince himself, simply unknown. Hidden behind a veil of secrets and lies, it's impossible to know for sure if Bellacor is doing the bidding of the Chaos Gods or working against them. However, his plots and plans have ultimately been instrumental in the destruction of much of the Imperium of Man. And those were 40 facts on the Demons of Chaos. If you guys did not hear your favorite named demon, let me know what it is in the comment section below and I'll try to create a video for you or I'll direct you to the 40 facts video uh, that we already have um, because we already have talked about a lot of the uh, greater demons. I tried to stay away from the greater demons because they have their own videos. I'll put a link up above to the playlist where you guys can get those or just check out the channel um, or search 40 facts on greater demon so and so and you'll probably find it. Uh, we, co we covered those a lot this past couple years uh, so so yeah if you guys have suggestions for any other topics just let me know what they are in the comment section below and I'll try to create a video for you guys and I hope you guys enjoy I'll talk to you guys tomorrow this was Gershwan with One Mind Syndicate signing out <laughs>